We'll be opening our Bibles again this time to Genesis chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 1 to 13. God has just finished making the world. He has given Adam and Eve their jobs. And now the story continues as we see what happens as Adam and Eve look to start doing what God has asked them to do. Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden. But the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and it was desirable for attaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, The woman you gave me gave to me to be with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. So the Lord God asked the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. We're leaving it there. This week we will continue the story next week. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me as I pray, and we prepare to hear what God has to say to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you will enable us to hear it rightly so that we may serve you with all our lives and be equipped to do the good deeds that you have prepared for us to do. Amen. So what's the first question that you would ask a potential roommate? Can you cook? Will you do the dishes? Do you have loud friends? Do you know how to get your sofa up the staircase? These are all pretty important questions to ask when someone is about to move in and live with you. But here in Genesis 3, we get a picture of what God wants when he lives with someone, when he moves in to live with his people. We get to see how much God desires to live with his people and the extent that he is willing to go to to ensure that that will happen. As I said, this is our first in two weeks in this foundational chapter of the Bible. And it's important because it highlights both God's love for his people, his desire to be with them, and exactly what he will do to make sure that all of his people are freely able to live with him when he returns. So just before the start of this chapter, in chapter 2, we get a very idealistic picture of the world. Man and woman are living with God in a garden, walking together, talking, tending and caring for the land that God has given to the man and the woman. And then in chapter 2, verse 25, we get a rather odd remark. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Now this verse shows us that the relationship between man and woman and between humanity and God 
is completely open. It is full of trust and honesty. And this picture is of a perfect world. God and humanity in perfect relationship. Humans in perfect relationship with each other. And then them in perfect relationship with the rest of creation. And chapter 3 starts. And it introduces us to a new character in this uh, this story. The serpent. Now the first thing that jumps out at lots of people as they read this is, hang on, the serpent can talk. Why can an animal talk? Did they all talk? Why did they stop talking? Well, we find out as we read our Bible, when we get to the book of Revelation, we find out that this is not just a serpent. Revelation chapter 19 has this description of the serpent. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. So the serpent isn't so much a talking animal, but an animal who has been twisted by the devil in order to corrupt God's good creation and to sow doubt in the minds of Adam and Eve about the goodness of God. So we don't believe in a talking animal, but we do believe in the Satan who will use any means at his disposal to try and corrupt God's good creation. And when the serpent starts talking, it's not a good thing. He says, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? He wants Adam and Eve to start questioning the goodness of God. God gave Adam and Eve every tree in the garden to eat from except one in the middle. But the devil is trying to say that they can't eat from any of them. And this is the same tactic that the devil uses with God's people today sowing doubt in our minds to make us think that God is not as good as he said he is. Did God really say you cannot serve both God and money? Did God really say you have to love your neighbour as yourself? Did God really say that sex is only for marriage? These are all the ways that the devil tries to sow doubt in our minds and to make a, cause us to distrust the goodness of God. But the devil goes further. He lies again. He says, you will not surely die. He causes Adam and Eve not just to doubt the goodness of God, but to assume that his judgment is unfair, to think that rebellion is freedom, even though nothing could be further from the truth. But his tactics work. Slowly we stop seeing God's goodness as good, his love as freedom, and we start seeing his rules as domineering. And we start seeing his kindness as hate. This is the tactic of the devil. This is how he started corrupting God's creation, and this is how he continues to do it. And then... Rather than leading the animals and ruling over the created world as they were supposed to, Adam and Eve start listening to one of the animals they were supposed to lead. They eat from the fruit of the tree that they were told not to eat. And suddenly, everything changes. The world is now broken. This is why the first thing they do is run to put clothes on. In contrast to the open relationship that they had, suddenly they need to hide. They need to hide not just from God, but from each other. They need to cover themselves up with clothes. They don't do this because clothes are bad. Clothes are pretty useful on mornings when you have to wake up and go to church and it's four degrees outside. But they cover up to show that their relationship is broken. It is not what it should be. Where there used to be openness, honesty and trust, there is now distrust, dishonesty, and hiding. And that doesn't just go for the relationship between men and women, but between us and God as well. We see that when he comes walking through the garden, 
they hide. God knows what's happened, but he asks questions to try and draw out repentance from his people. But instead, the man and the woman start shifting the blame, offering excuses, trying to weasel out of what they have done. But they can no longer live with God. He sends them out of the garden. And because they have been removed from the very source of life itself, they will now face death, disease, and decay. Why can't God live with his people anymore? I mean, it was just a piece of fruit. Surely it's not that bad. Well, the Bible tells us that God is absolutely holy. And that means that he is so perfect that any imperfection that comes near him is destroyed. God cannot be near sin. He cannot live with sin. If you start digging in your garden to try and tend it and maintain it, do you notice the dirt that comes under your fingernails? Probably not. You can work in your garden all day, and then eventually when you sit down for dinner, you look at your fingers and you go, oh, wow, I've got dirt under my fingernails. You don't notice it. It doesn't matter so much, and you'll kind of fix it whenever you get around to it. But what happens when you get dirt in your eye? If you get dirt in your eye, that requires immediate attention. Your eyes start watering, you start blinking, you can't see properly and you need to get it out right then and there. You can't leave it until later. When it comes to sin, we are a bit like fingernails. We don't notice the sin in our lives. It affects us, but we think we can deal with it later. It doesn't bother us. But for God, when it comes to sin, he's like an eye. It is an irritant that needs to be get gotten rid of straight away. It cannot be in his presence. And so that means anything that is sinful is either destroyed or cast out from the presence of our holy God. And because we are sinful, that means us. The rest of the Bible's story from this point on is all about how God is going to live with his people again, his dogged pursuit of a people who keep rejecting him. He wants to live with his people, the ones he created, his children, and he is going to make sure that happens no matter what. First, he calls Noah puts Noah on an ark and saves him from the judgment of the flood. He sees Abraham, calls him out of the city of Ur, brings him to the land that he promised to give him. From Abraham, he grows a nation that he will call his own people. He rescues them out of Egypt, and then he lives with them. His presence comes down from heaven and joins them in the tabernacle, and later the temple. This is why the book of Leviticus is so important. It's a book that we often skip, but Leviticus is the rules for how a sinful people can live with an absolutely holy God. It's like the rules that you put up in your first share house, where you say who's going to do the dishes and when to make sure there's harmony in the house. But when there is an absolutely holy God living in a world that is corrupted by sin and amongst a sinful people, the book of Leviticus outlines how that is possible, how God can live with his people. Then, later, when God settles his people in the land that he promised to give them, his presence moves from the tent into the temple. And we get this rather odd description of the the room in the middle of the temple. The interior of the sanctuary was 30 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 30 feet high, and Solomon overlaid it with pure gold. That's from 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 20, for those of you playing at home. In the middle of the temple is this cube-like room covered in gold, but it is there that God makes his presence known. That is where God is living with his people. 
But that room is separated from the world by a giant curtain. And that curtain is in the middle of a giant temple. Because of our sin, we can't come in. But still, God is there with his people. But God's plan was never to be satisfied with just a small golden cube in the middle of a temple. John, in his biography of Jesus, starts by talking about God. Chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But then, later on in in verse 14, he says something truly astounding. The Word became flesh and took up residence amongst us. In Jesus, God is walking with his people once again. In the cool of the afternoon, in the heat of the day, God is amongst his people. If you had been there, you could have seen him. He was living with his people. And then, just like Adam and Eve, the people, us, we decide that we don't want God to be God. We think we know better. And so we take God, we take Jesus, nail him to a cross and murder him. But God, in his infinite wisdom, uses that very act of rebellion to be the very thing that saves us, the very thing that cures us from our sin and allows us to live with him. It is in the death and resurrection of Christ that God fixes the barriers that were stopping us from living with him forever. He tears them down. And now, as his friends, as his children, we can dwell with him forever. He can now live with his people. Sin has been dealt with on the cross. The death of God the Son paid the penalty we deserved. And so now, we can live with God. But where is God now? Jesus was walking around, but then he went up to heaven and is now seated at the right hand of God, ruling the world. And we know that he's going to come back, but how is God living with his people at the moment? Well, that is where our reading from 1 Corinthians comes in. Did you notice what he said towards the end? Don't you know your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. God is with us because God the Holy Spirit dwells with all of his people. The sin that has marred every generation of humanity since the beginning has now been dealt with. The holy God is now free to dwell with his people once more. And he does so in us. He lives with us by his spirit that he gives to everyone who trusts in him. That means people should notice that we are not the same as we used to be. This is why it matters how we live. Just imagine that Barack Obama decided to show up to your place for dinner one day. If you knew he was coming, you would make pretty sure that the house was absolutely spotless before he got there. But the amazing thing about God coming to live with his people is he doesn't expect a spotless house. The death and resurrection of Jesus has opened the way for him to come and live with us. And then when he comes in, he's the type of guest who says, let me help you with the dishes. Let me help you get clean. God doesn't expect us to be perfect before we come to him. But by his spirit, he makes us fit to live with him because of what God Jesus has done for us. People should notice that we are different because God is living with us. He is guiding us through the toughest times. But then, 
that's not the end of the story. There's so much more to it. Because in Revelation 21, we get a picture of a new city. Verses 16 and 17 describes a city like this. The city is laid out in its square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with a rod at 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits according to the human measurement, which the angel used. The building material of its wall is jasper. And the city was pure gold, like clear glass. This is an odd city. It's a giant cube, 12,000 stadia long, wide, and high, and it's made of pure gold. When was the last time we just heard about a golden cube? It was back in the temple, where God lived. The new city that is coming is where God will live. He will walk once again with his people. When he comes again, when he makes the new earth and invites us to live with him forever, he will not be living with us by his spirit, although he still will. He will be walking with us like he did in the garden. Our relationship with God will no longer be marred by sin. It will be totally restored and we will be with him, talking with him day after day. There are times in life when it feels like God is a million miles away, when he has no idea what's going on and it feels like we are left alone. But because of the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives, nothing could be further from the truth. That is another lie that the devil wants us to believe, that God is not with us, that he has abandoned us. But he has not. So if you feel like God is a million miles away, if you don't know where God is, just remember the whole story of the Bible is about God wanting to live with his people. It's the story of how in sending his son Jesus to die on the cross, he has made it possible to dwell with God forever. He is the one who makes us right and he has given us his spirit so he can be with us no matter what happens. And so we need to remember in those dark times that God is always there. He will not leave us because we are his children. And when you look around and despair at the state of the world, when you think, how could anything get any worse? Just remember, this is not the end of the story. A day is coming when God will walk with his people once more when he will call us to live with him forever, to dwell with him on the new earth, where there is no more death, no more crying, no more pain. This is not the world as it should be, but God is making all things new. They will be as they should be. We will dwell with God forever. No matter how dark the night, there is always hope. Christ has fixed our broken relationship with God. He enables us to live with him. He equips us to serve him, and then he dwells with us by his spirit. We are now a signpost. We are God's message to the world to say, God is still here. You can find him in the person of Jesus and in what he has done. And so we live lives that reflect that God is living in us. Lives that flee from sin wherever possible. Lives that ask God for help when we are stuck. And lives that do not despair at the state of the world, but look boldly to the future and the hope that God has given us, that he will come, he will make all things new, and we will dwell forever with the one who created us. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have done all that is required for us to live with you, and we pray that in those moments that we feel far from you, that you will help us to feel your presence, 
so that we can know that you are with us and one day will call us to live with you. Amen.